Hello and welcome to which I think is the 10th 18 Brumaire live stream. We have uh, the usual suspects he here today. We have all the way from sunny Botswana. I think it is. Kyle, how's it going? Oh, great. Uh, I just do so much traveling these days. It's wonderful. Yeah, oh to be a uh, oh to be a, a member of the bourgeoisie with a stipend from your rich daddy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. Trust fund baby Kyle Thompson, well yeah. known, well known, going around the world on his catamaran. I've seen it all. Now, next time we're going all the way to. Uh, I don't know where to say. We'll say somewhere like I say Michigan. Uh, Puya, how's it going? Hey, it's going good. Um, it's going good here in uh, sunny Michigan. Hey, the Michigan. <laughs> where about are you? Uh, like we're a little bit outside of Detroit. Detroit, close enough. Okay. Yeah. Now, pretty close. How far? Yeah, how far is Michigan? How far is Michigan from Detroit? It's in it, Detroit's in Michigan. There you go. Fuck it. I, I didn't I guess that. Okay, right. Let's go. Oh, Michigan is a state. <laughs> That's right. What's the capital of Michigan? Is Lansing. It Lansing. I was going to say Lansing. I remember. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Is that like good? Okay. Okay. Now, finally, we've got uh, the Two-Headed Beast returning and renamed as uh, Ezri Sophia. How's it going? Doing great. Beast with two backs forever. <laughs> um, yeah, so I moved to Phoenix. Uh, Sophia moved to Phoenix. We're in the same domicile. We're cohabitating in sin. It's everything we thought it could be. Yay, sin. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Tom. Yes. I wanted to. I wanted to just mark something. Is that last episode was the first time that I have not been present for the from Alpha to Omega reading series. I was on every episode of Reclaiming Marx's Capital, every episode of Revolutionary Strategy, and every episode up until this point of 18th Brumaire. Last time was the first time, and like in Swampside, the only episodes where I was absent is because I was moving. So what's the only thing that can stop me from podcasting? Moving. Moving. That's right. <laughs> That's a weak-ass excuse. Seriously. <laughs> um, what was I supposed to do? Like, COVID it up on the plane and, you know? With like, all these... You know, Watching all everyone about like you know lumping proletariat on the fucking flight. Like, what do you want from me? Fucking right. And uh, uh, yeah, no, it uh, reminds. I don't know why I'm thinking of this story, but a friend of mine was a uh, was a uh, uh, a very bad alcoholic, and uh, he was working in London when I moved over at the time, and he. Uh, he went. He was off the drink, and then he basically went drinking after work on like a, a Friday evening. And uh, he woke up then on a plane <laughs> on, 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 on Monday morning and he had no recollection of the last whole weekend and he didn't know where the plane was going. And he, he was sitting beside some young woman and he turned to her and he goes, sorry, he's a big guy, this guy's rather, you couldn't tell me where this, where this plane is going, could you? And he only looked at him with, with horror, you know, he was stinking probably a beer, or wine or whatever. And uh, she was like, yeah, we're, we're going to Thailand. And he was like, oh, bollocks. So he had to ring up work from, you know, the on the, the plane phones. And he used to, you know, the plane phones with a credit card. And he'd ring up and pretend that he was like, uh, he was um, sick or something. And then he had to fly. He had to land in B Bangkok and get on a plane and fly all the way back. Landed in, in London on Tuesday morning just in time to go straight from the airport into work in the same suit that he'd been sweating and boozing in for like four days straight. My God. I don't know why I told that story. Oh my God. Uh, Gross. He has no, he has no actual memory of actually like any of it. So he's no memory of how we could get onto the plane. Like how drunk must he have been? He would have had to have gone home, gone to the airport, bought the flight in the airport, huh. managed to get through checking the whole lot. Wow. Amazing. Bangkok, huh? Uh, what was the air uh, flight like, Ezri? Oh. Oh, it was great. I took a clonazepam and played Rome Total War. 
did a little editing. It's amazing. Were, were you the only person on the plane? No, but I was the only person in my row. That's good. That's nice. All right. Yeah, that was that was awesome. I, there was that. like when COVID when COVID started, and I came uh, from Madrid to Michigan. I took a plane from New York City uh, to Grand Rapids, and I was the only person in the plane. Fuck's sake! What's that carbon footprint like? Holy shit! What do you mean? Oh, it was a small cabin, but it was only me. Oh, yeah. So then it's probably only like chopping down 400 acres of prime, primeval forest. <laughs> That's all its equivalent. They were telling me that they were flying planes with zero people on them. Holy shit. Oh, my God. They had to, don't like, they, to, to the keep the charter. Attendance. They had to yeah, keep the gas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Invest, invest in air, airlines while you can. Yeah, really. You, you know, it's kind of. It, <laughs> It was funny because I was moving from the New York metro area to Arizona. So it was almost like I was following the COVID spikes. <laughs> and almost like I'm a harbinger of, of bad tidings. Uh, yeah, um, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. You're like uh, really grand sense. zero, grand zero for the infection. Yep. It <laughs> moves with me. You know, uh, that's true. Okay, well, let, let's start going. Before we go on with yeah. uh, chapter five which yeah. is the speaking chapter of infection speaking of infection um we uh well, this one is the the um bonaparte versus the national assembly but um prior, prior last week uh lex or esri and um and sophia were listening and maybe some other members of the panel previous members of the panel when we went through marx's uh description of the what do we call them? The lumpen proletariat. Um, some people think that we didn't really do a proper, um, a, a proper uh, critique of Marx's class analysis here. And uh, Esri or Sophia, do one of you <laughs> two want to lay in here because you really wanted to talk about <sighs> this section here? I have highlighted. Yeah, because like. I think, uh, so Kyle and I were talking earlier about how, like, probably the first, like, everything up through the third chapter where he's, you know, dunking on social Democrats is probably just the best Marx that I've read. And I, and Kyle, I think I speak for you when, and yeah, saying that it's too. fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Um, chapter four is mainly historical analysis, you know, whatever. Uh, chapter five, I've never seen Marx like fail so spectacularly at the thing that I read him for, which is a sober class analysis. And it's really about the lumpen proletariat. And I agree with part of what you were saying last time that he's probably like, you know, signaling at, signaling at like Bakunin or, you know, people that had a lot of Kind of hopes for the revolutionary lump and proletariat at that time but just what's on the paper you know what i mean um this is a fucking conspiracy theory he sounds like alex jones he sounds like alex jones these these lump and proletariat they're going to be led by a bonaparte patients they're going to put water <laughs> in the frogs that make them gay yeah and vagabonds and discharge soldiers and escape galley slaves and swindlers and pimps <laughs> literati and organ grinders and they're gonna I don't know they're gonna like put sodium chloride in our DNA and <laughs> turn us an anti super soldier you know whatever like it's the it's the being led by the Bonapartist agent that was like yeah I know that this might sound strange but that was the most shocking to me because I knew he hated the love of proletariat I knew he could be a little bit of an asshole let's be real but I wasn't expecting him to be like to sound like that, that sounds crazy. You know what that, I mean? Well, it sounds unhinged. And it's been a long time since I've listened to the Mike Duncan, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sections on, on uh, you know, Bonapartism and, and all that jazz. So maybe I don't remember it properly. I don't remember much about all this. I don't even really remember much about the Society of December 10th. I mean, I feel like Duncan at least makes a note that Marx isn't at his most. Uh, that's what I remember. 
I don't think that's a hard, I don't think that's too hard of a judgment. Is it, is it too harsh? I just, I felt like you all were soft on Marx just because you wanted to bring out his kind of thought process, which I don't, it, I like that you're explicating his thought process. I just think that this lines up with the moralism of the classical work, workers movement, like one-to-one, -one, right? essentially. That's um, something we have to overcome in Marxism, in my opinion. Yeah. And yeah, maybe like, I think Derek brought this up last time, like, you know, going all in and the lump in as a response isn't oh, that's just accurate know. either. My dad was a Christian and I'm a Satanist. You know, that's that's simply inverting the framework and Okay, just at me next time. Oh, I'm sorry, but <laughs> um, uh, you know I think, I, that's just I think it, like keeping the framework and inverting the values. But like right. if you if in the lump and proletariat you're gonna put like pimps and in, in other places he puts, you know, uh, sex workers, you know, uh, so called prostitutes. Like he puts them in the same category. That's not really class analysis. <laughs> nope. No, but I think um, like it. It could. It is like super moral, but uh, I think he could. You could use it as a class category if you like took out the moralism. Like you know, a beggar I don't think isn't. You can use... uh, Sorry. I mean, like yeah. I mean, they don't. Uh, they don't work. You know. Well, well, I think you can. You can. They don't use... do productive. They don't do productive labor, but they do beg. It is like, it is. It's not like it's not work. You go so on the train the here in London. And... It's not. Or, or... It's super under theorized. Like, give but me they don't work for somebody. Development proletariat based on what you, we have here. It's basically anyone that's like excluded from the wage relation. And yeah, that but might, but here. Really like... Here it's like, uh, yeah, like you were saying, like it's kind of confused. Like, it's like, yeah, it includes uh, brothel keepers. I mean, that's a that's bourgeoisie, <laughs> like I'd say. Well, like, yeah, it's it's just ramming together people that make their living scamming, like the proletariat, and like like subjugating and exploiting like you know of other lumpen you know what i mean like and like you say like some of these are small property holders they're not even like really proles and even if you're sympathetic to like small proprietarians that are like low income and illegal or you know made kind of like black market you know you can't just have the same analysis for brothel keepers and you know the workers in the brothel like it just doesn't fucking make sense yeah, like you're no. totally letting the law call the shots. But you're but all the wage but, form call the, you're, if that's yeah. not even it's like sex workers make some kind of like they do make money and there is like exploitation there if they have a pimp or or a madame or whatever. Se the sex, sex workers are exploited as shit. Yeah, but the, the yeah. point the point here is as well. Well, I do like what well, no one is objected to here is literati. <laughs> Let that be noted. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I, I think this has bad implications for verso bucks. Well, fucking right. But um, so but uh, what I, what I would say here is that he did he is not saying that like all pickpocket pickpockets are all like galley slaves were basically not all lumpen. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know if he is this what he is saying that these are is is he saying like all of the lumpen backed him or there was like large segments of lumpen backing him? I mean, uh, somewhere here he says that Bonaparte is essentially the political form of the lumpen proletariat. Like that's the the chief, the chief of the lumpen proletariat. Yeah. Like in so many words, that's like the class expression in political terms. Is this? You might say anti-political kind of um, support of a, you know, of a Bonaparte. That's the expression of the lumpen proletariat. Like, he's not distinguishing between, like, petty bourgeoisie that are like, you know, and then let's be real, petty bourgeoisie and organized crime are like, you know, Carl Weathers predator handshake. Like, you know, they're they're usually kind of hand in hand like i don't know small business people that survive that don't like skate a lot of taxes um and yeah i don't know like let, let, it's, let's have it's a really, it's really that kind of thing more so than and you were good about this last time it's really that kind of thing more so than um than the lumpen proles proper that are that like 
that le- that go for the Bonaparte. Like if we're going to even use Trump as a highly like far away example, it is so much less the, uh, you know, the, the pimps and the pushers and the prostitutes, you know, like it's so much less those people that uh, went in for Trump. I think you said that those people are more likely actually to be like <laughs> the grifter, like the, the, the grifter political class m- more so than the, the base, which I think is true. <laughs> Like, I think that's actually true. But th- their base is the petty bourgeoisie. And, and you made the comparison to fascism as well. Like, right. The- like, think of the people who, who, the fa- who uh, really get into Trump and all the, like, the weird right-wing militia types and stuff like that. They're mostly PBs. But also, but, like, I don't know. Like, they're also just, like, poor racists. Like, there are, yeah, there are the some, PB I, can't I, I explain the, the, the mass of it. The PB just not big enough to to explain the mass that's behind no, Trump. It's you're just right. Not. It's, it's a coalition between racist white workers and uh, PBs, and it's obviously not all PBs go for Trump either. But like the kind of PBs who can like afford a big truck and a McMansion in the suburbs and call themselves cowboys and LARP and malicious and harass people on the border. Calgarians. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Or even, That's or even, or even about. just and coffee shop right owners. Workers who want to be those people. Yeah, or even just like coffee shop owners, or you know, small businesses, you know, like printer shops. Like those type of people are probably heavily Trump supporters, but they're probably also heavily racist. Same people. Like, yeah, but like, uh, yeah, I, I know, but I'm just saying that that's not that, there's not that many p- petty bourgeois. But when we get to, like, like looking here at, 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 let's go through the list then of all these people. Trump, I do want to so- clarify, though, I think in the, you're underestimating how many TV are in the, in the U.S. Yeah, because there's like that whole, you know, post-war settler compact to make like a middle class that, and a lot of the, a lot of the union stuff is demolished, but there's still like, but like what PB what, in the U.S. P- people who, who whose families made made it well, you know, during the post-war compromise and were able to maintain their wealth, their kids are probably suffering. But those, you know, Gen X to Boomer generation people who uh, have maintained their wealth and maybe some some of their kids who inherited that and are you know alt-right adjacent kind of brats, uh, those are kind of the the PBs we're talking about here, and there's plenty of them. It, there's it's a shrinking yeah. it's a shrinking demographic, but there's still a lot. But like, are, 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 is is petty bourgeois not just a me- it's not is it not more like a measure of what type of of a uh, it's not just an income based description, it's a production You're based right. description, and yeah, like there's like, just not enough shopkeepers in fucking America to to be twenty to be thirty percent or twenty percent of the vote. Like half of Trump's people are just Republicans and half of them are fucking probably diehard fucking racists. Like there's just not enough PB diehard fucking racists out there to be 20% of the population. <laughs> so I, we should, we should, we should uh, like do some, yeah, do, we should do some numbers on this. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, so just let, let's go through just, I think it may be interesting to go through the actual things who he, who he says are in this, uh, Lump and, prol- lump and proletariat and see yeah. do we agree or disagree with yeah, this? Like, <laughs> why not have a good alex jones voice uh uh so uh you know i i think some of these we may have a, a hard time uh analyzing such as like like what's our take on the class nature of lazaroni <laughs> well like, la- so like, la- like lazaroni of- are like lazaroni are like a uh, kind of uh, I think kind of uh, beggars from uh, Naples. That's yeah, that's who they are. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like what, but, what, what's but, the class content of tricksters? Mm. But you know what I mean, like, uh, like, like, would we say that we would put like people who are like tricksters, uh, pickpockets into the lumpen? I, I, um, yeah, and yeah, and, of course, they're, they're, yeah, they're, that 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 makes Morgan, sense. If we're going to use the category lumpen, and we're, I think it's there is something built into it that's moralistic. But if we're going to try to put that aside because exploitation has moralistic content too, but we try to put that aside as Marxist, right? So the, the lumpen proletariat are people that, or you know, proles that prey on other proles. Normally, they prey on proles that the proper proletariat that are in the circuit of the wage form. So, like, 
If you're, well, you know, Johnny the plumber comes home from work and the pickpocket runs his pockets and gets the precious, you know, um, labor power wages, right? That makes sense. Yeah. yeah so that's kind of what I, I'm trying I to get think, at. Um, yeah, it, it's probably like one of those. Uh, I mean, if you like make your living, uh, I'm being, you know, through um, stealing. Then uh, I don't think that's yeah, it's not proletarian, like strictly speaking, because you don't have work for a wage. I mean, it depends how you define proletarian, right? The whole concept of lumpen proletarian, I guess, in a way, you you could think of it as people that are like outside of the proletarian relation. But the way that I normally think about it is that you know, pro, proles just have basically nothing but the shirt on their backs or at the very least, you know, their hustle or their, you know, job is their primary form of income. They don't have capital. That's, that's what I normally think. And I, and I normally don't, I normally don't distinguish between the wage form and the hustle that much because I feel like it, obs it sort of legalistically obscures the fact that they have no capital. Well, you, you also have to take into account, like, what the Reserve Army of Labor is doing when they're not actually employed, right? Yeah, completely. But, but I, well, I, think, I think if you I got think also, on a, I think there's a thing of time in there. So, like, uh, you know, if it's like a crisis and you're unemployed and, uh, I don't know, you steal some... Uh, yeah, I think if there's a crisis and you get unemployed, you're, you're still a pro. But uh, if it's full employment and you make a living uh, through, you know, yeah, pr like preying on people or, you know, pickpocketing or et cetera, uh, then you I think that would be lumped in proletariat. Like, I I'm just looking here at, like, the definition of a galley slave, like, you know, <laughs> like so a lot of times. Right. Well, like it's the escape galley slaves you got to look out for. Yeah, they're the bad ones. No, but like, so the galley slave is a slave uh, in a rowing galley, either a convicted criminal, right, sentenced to work at the oar, or a kind of human chattel off in the prisoner of war. Like in France, they were literally sometimes American fucking Indians, or uh, uh, like American Native Americans who um, were like just fucking chained up. Like there was 50 Iroquois chiefs. Uh, from Fort Frontenac to Marseille, France uses galley slaves. So, like, there's a mix. Like, a lot of these, like, say, discharged soldiers, like, um, like, um, like, a, that's a, a very mixed, it's a very catch all thing. Isn't it like, you know, like, there's discharged soldiers who get their leg blown off, and then there's other ones who are discharged because they were fucking assholes and swindlers or something. So, well, it's it a very. This way. Imagine a Marxist today being like, oh, those fucking lumpen who, you know, are escaped from prison who are, you know, according to the Constitution, legally slaves because you can still be a slave as a punishment for a crime. Like, fuck those guys, right? Like, we wouldn't take that shit seriously. Those those thieving mm -hmm. looters, those riders, those thugs. Right. <laughs> I mean, those, you know, those no, scum. Like, come that on. is taken. That I'm taking it on board. I'm just trying to give the argument. Like, I do, I, I completely, you. like, I, I completely take it. Like, I'm trying to get at what... Like because obviously there is a class content to what the what the the Decemberists were, for example, mm. and all the fucking shenanigans and stuff they were getting up to, right? So it's like, you know, we gotta like, we we can't not do an analysis of who they are because uh, they contain certain types of peoples that we would feel bad about saying it contains. Do you know what I mean? Like at some point you have to do the fucking analysis, right? Right, right, right. No. But the what what yeah. about lumpen? Mark uh, Mark definitely anything. kind of fucks it up. What what about lumpen says anything that can't be accomplished through like surplus population, surplus proletariat, you know, or or whatever? Or and because I don't think we because the source as like an accurate source of like who is the class content that supports Bonaparte, it may be correct, but this is so full of vitriol that like yeah. I kind of want to trust but verify, or maybe slightly distrust and check. Yeah, the, the, well, I I would... the main thing that I don't like about this is that it undermines my trust in Marx's analysis here. And that I, 
now have to actually do the, instead of just having pamphlet brain and feeling smug about it, I actually have to go do the legwork. So thank you, Marx, for not being good all the time. No, like that's, that's, that's well, very fair. I, I think all those points are very fair, but like for one thing I would say why your description, Le uh, Esri, uh, wouldn't work is because some of these aren't surplus pop, uh, surplus proletariat or whatever. Some of these aren't, like a brothel keeper is not, right? A literati isn't. Okay. Like, but, a por then, like a porter isn't like I mean that's why I mean it's a weird yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's that, right but but why are they all in the same class category then right it, we actually that actually weakens Marx's argument more than strengthens it and I don't I don't think your your intention was to strengthen his argument but I think it just throws the whole category into further question well you know maybe there's you know like what lumpen petty bourgeoisie or whatever and or you know surplus petty bourgeoisie I, however you cut it like we have to change the class relation but like, um. So you have like, to bifurcate this, like, and distinguish between the pimp and the sex worker. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like it shouldn't be called lumpen proletariat. It should be called just like lumpen whatever the fuck. I don't know because it's like it has elements of petty bourgeois. It has elements of like, like God knows it's probably should be putting the fucking cops in here. Is there any I, cops? <laughs> you know what I mean? Um. Well, the, Jay Sakai, the guy that wrote Settlers, who essentially claims that you know, in his kind of memeified way that there's no white proletariat in the United States. Uh, as he kind of aged, he did kind of look at uh, cops as lumpen proletariat, which I thought, was, you know, it's an interesting turn of phrase. It's an interesting turn of the moralism of the workers' movement tradition. Yeah, but it, de it definitely is full of moralism. Like, that's that's to be undoubted. But um, I do think, like, you know, like, when Marx is doing his analysis, sometimes not all the oh, not all of the uh, um, classes are, like, um, what's that word? Like, they're not. it's not like a Venn diagram. Some of them overlap, don't they? Um, um, like, what do you mean? What's an, like, what do you think about? Um. I'm trying to think now, <laughs> but like the lump and prone of, uh, yeah, like exactly. I think like the lump and prone, like, like the proletarian and the bourgeoisie uh, kind of overlap. I would, I would think the lump and proletariat is not from how is it described here is not, uh, is not, is not all contained within the proletariat. It's uh, an intersection. Like if you were to draw a Venn diagram, you'd have one one lump and circle, one one for uh, sorry, one for proletariat, one for petty bourgeois, and they're separate. And then you'd have like the lump and proletariat, which intersects and contains both elements of both. Yeah, um, this is some this is something that you might call like a contradictory class location when we talk about Eric Olin Wright. Um, although this is part of his like earlier framework, like he does get into situations where, you know, people have multiple sources of income and they, they are a part of the Venn diagram. Um, you know, maybe lumpen at some point would be a, a category worth looking at if you can like do, you know, do concept surgery on it, reconstructive surgery, whatever. But like- Yeah, it definitely needs some surgery. Is, as, as is, this is like a, if you swap out lumpen for parasite, you basically have Marx's meaning. Yeah. I, I, I think I almost want to say like in the Marxist tradition, if this is our starting point, and I think this is what the starting point of most people, even the new left are kind of responding to this. I honestly think this whole category should kind of just be like tossed away and we should start over with something that's a little bit less. Yeah. Insane. Cause I think that, uh, Ezri, when you're saying that if you replace this uh, description of lumpen uh, proletariat with parasite, it would be more accurate. I think that's exactly it. Like that actually resolves a lot of the uh, questions that we have. Like, are they really proletarian? Blah, blah, blah. Like, is a literati really proletarian? Like, actually, if you just swap in parasite, like all those things disappear. And what Marx is saying, like, actually makes a lot more sense like you can understand his reasoning better if you remove the proletarian label and just put in parasite well i the, don't think so i don't it's think a good so movie. Yeah. because it, would, if you say, if you say parasite right how are you leaving yeah. out the fucking main class of capitalists how are they not a parasite so parasite is too broad i think it has to be more specific the other, right. the other, be, be, the other because, point i would make generally speaking tom uh marx tries to whenever he's deploying moralistic language, he normally, normally, like, normally, like, he'll try to emulate the morals of the society. So the 
the bourgeoisie, they're job creators. <laughs> you know, they're like the, the wage form exploits justly. Um, whereas these people, these are the unjust. These are the parasites. Even though we all know exploitation has moral uh, Marx but is I saying, oh, no, there's no, there's no moral content to it. I don't have any morality. I don't believe in justice. I don't believe in equality. That's not what I'm doing, even though I am. Like, but th that's not what I'm doing. Um, so I think, I think that's the angle there, is that this is something that the society also thinks is, you know, illegitimate forms of predation. Where surplus yeah. extraction, you can't have society without surplus extraction. So like when he says, just. when he says ruined and adventurous offshoots of the bourgeoisie, it kind of has some implications about the legitimacy of the bourgeoisie otherwise, right? Like that it's it's these like fail sons and like you know. Uh, disgraced people who uh, from the bourgeoisie who fall into this group. Um, they're you know they're adventurers. They're not like you know legitimate business people. That's the that's the the connotations of what he's saying here. But but also it's like it's just people in who work in like uh, kind of semi probably are criminal enterprises. You know mafia types. Gangsters, yeah, which, gangsters. which, Our which petty if, bourgeois on some level. Yeah, but what I'm what I'm saying, Tom, is like that if we like actually remove the class analysis from this description and just look at it moralistically in terms of parasites, it's a lot more coherent. I was yeah, also. Well, I, I mean, I brought up the movie as, as it's here, presented. Right? As I, I think joke, that's true. But I think that I think that uh, it's interesting in that movie is that both the people that they work for the you know bourgeois people that they work for and the lumpen who's scamming them are both you know parasitic in their own right it's kind of the point of that movie you know well, and the movie definitely sympathizes more with like the poor lumpen family but you know no spoilers well, but it's it gets rough yeah legitimacy is the key word there's legitimate parasites that run society that are the foundation of every mode of production. And then there's this social scum. Right. <clears throat> um, I think the difference between the bourgeoisie and the lumpen, if you want to make it like a category that makes sense, is uh, the bourgeoisie has capital and the lumpen does not. So uh, like how I think of the lumpen, it's like beggars. You know, they don't have any capital. They don't work for anybody. But uh, are, what, are they... what about brothel keeper? Come on, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no but, but, but the, the concept doesn't make sense. But I feel like there's some <laughs> of the of the, like, I feel like you can, we should probably there's like, there's like, uh, you know, the you can recover something out of it. I think you can recover something like, uh, um, you know, like the beggar, uh, they don't work, they don't have capital, they, um, the Lazzaroni, and I, I don't, I don't I know don't, what that is, yeah, no, I'm joking. Like, <laughs> I, 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 I think I would go further than you. I, I think I go, I, I have a different take on this. I don't think that it's really something that's going to be based. I don't think it's a static class for one. And I, I don't actually think that it's, um, uh, I don't actually think it's that, it, it's, it's so much founded in uh, material conditions. Like I think if there was a similar, if, if there was going to be like, if Trump was actually, Say for example, if Trump was actually going to do a a, 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 a Louis Bonaparte, right? And uh, what would his equivalent lump and proletariat be? A lot of them would be actually workers. A lot of them would be racists. And I don't think that it's a static uh, lump. I think that if you were to look across um, different, like. Uh, kind of Bonapartist types. I think like there could be quite large differences within what would make up what Marx would call the lumpen. What do people think about that? Well, I think it's like a worker. You know, you have uh, workers at one point in time. Uh, they work in factories. But but uh, then but that's then that's not the point. Though. Later, yeah, yeah. But then it's fifty years later, and uh, now they're working in tech industries or you know whatever you want to say. And then, um, so I think lumpen, 
uh, a good way to pose it is that they're people that live off the wage fund without capital. So they're like expo- they're like exploiting people, but they have no capital. But like, I don't know. I I, I imagine well, if you were... we're not going to sort this out this this session. We just wanted to give like a critique because I feel like it was missed last time. But I don't want to spend all episode on this either. But it's your show, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's an interesting conversation. Like the, the thing I would say is that like I would think like that there are probably if if Trump was to do something right. Imagine he was. He would have loads of actual workers working in normal day to day jobs that would be his base. Like, um, but are we saying that there's a difference between his base and this lump and proletariat? Like, are we saying that these are basically the December 10th? But like Napoleon had uh, December, t- slightly December 10th people. But he, Napoleon also had general broad support in the population too. How do we split them apart? Yeah, uh, just to sort of give some kind well, of definite... Exp- or definite information about things that Napoleon, uh, that Louis Bonaparte did. Uh, uh, for example, he started a jobs program once he was in power uh, that was about, you know, reconstructing Paris. Um, and this did give him uh, quite a bit of popularity uh, with workers. Um just as an example of, of how he was able to, to get support from people who were not, uh, <laughs> who were not, uh, quote unquote, lumpen uh, in that sense. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, we, like, it's a, uh... that's a good point. Um, the comments, uh, but hopefully you see what I'm saying. Maybe I didn't pose it correctly. Let, yeah, I'm, it loud, I guess. Oh yeah, sorry. So Stank in the comments says people who live off yeah, the wage fund that, without true. capital are proles, Puya. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, that's that's true. But um, like I don't know how to uh, articulate. Well, okay, it. but like let's let's take that logic a bit further then, and but, get but into wait, the pro- I, You get into the problem of unproductive labor, right? Unproductive workers are then oh, lumpen. No, no, no. I think I think that I think that category is also like kind of BS. Like like if you're a worker that works in a grocery shop shop, you're productive. But what about like, I, who work who do reproductive labor for pay and sometimes not for pay? Uh, yeah. But well, it's, uh, it's we, complicated. Uh, yeah. Like, but well, you were not- saying like uh Tom, you were like uh these group of people that like Napoleon, they're like this and then uh or the, the people that Napoleon was drawing off of, um, they have like, uh, how do we explain that? Like, kind of what I think Marx is getting at when he makes these class categories is that he's trying to, you know, like at one point, like the proletariat might be kind of conservative, but like these, there are these material, like the how the economy works, it kind of like. Uh, disposes them uh, it gives them like a disposition towards progressive politics like uh, that's more objective if that sorry if that's like badly posed but I'm not I'm not a talker so if, if I need that to explain anything please let me know you're a talker yeah. Puya. no but I, I, hear what you're <laughs> I think it's contingent on the situation like uh, I guess the, okay something that pops into my mind is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois you know uh, Black Reconstruction in America. He does the class breakdown of the American South. And like, you know, poor whites become like, you know, are, are you know, they have a pretty shit time um, and they get hired as the slave overseers, right? Like, and there's, you know, there's, that's, you know, very contingent on their political situation, how progressive they are, right? Or, in, or and even the economic situation, you know, they've been basically made obsolete in that point in time by slave labor, and um, are essentially surplus population. And when they are hired, they're basically hired to police other workers. Like so, something I would say here is that, like when, like Marx is like what. Well, I don't know. Well, like what we're not being, what I'm not being clear of, 
I th about here, I think, is that this is how he's describing what the society of December 10th were made up of. So, like, when we're looking at Trump supporters, we're not looking at an equivalent because there is no society like this, you know, underground, you know, society who's actually doing lots of particular fucking underhand shit for Trump. You know, there's not an exact... Um, like model of what's going on in America at the moment for this, what Marx is calling the lumpen proletariat here. Like when getting to what Derek was saying about like in Egypt, it strikes me that if you had a had a a like a dict dictatorship in countries, like I think that you could imagine like all their snitches and people that actually managed to keep people down would be largely made up of people who might have these type of jobs. Um, I don't know if that's would you call them a lumpen? Um, I I don't know. I, I'm kind of confused. Uh, I, I, what, what I, of I I knew people like I've known people who were like CIA snitches and they were bourgeois, like <laughs> like <laughs> and they were working for a dictatorship. You know, it's yeah. But I'm not. Ta I'm talking more about the dictator, the people who work for the dictator. You know, like who snitch on neighbors and keep stuff going, or even like, yeah. You wonder what it's like in, um, say, like East Germany and shit like that, or you know, in North Korea. Who, who are like? Do they have lumpen? No, the Stasi's infiltration of society was way more extensive than that. They had like one in thirty-one people was a spy or something. But like, uh, how big was this? Um, how big is the 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 society of December tenth? It's got to be fairly big. Yeah, but it it doesn't have the same character at all as what the, as, as Stasi informants. It's just not the same. No, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, like, like let's let's move on. Unless anybody has, wants to have the last talk, I've I've fucking said a lot here um I, I i'm not making a case <laughs> i agree with this paragraph i'm just trying to interrogate it before uh, i get uh, i get cancelled by esri and sophia um anybody have, who wants a final word uh, i think the main point to take away here is that marx is making a pretty simple point in this chapter he's saying that uh Louis Napoleon is the chief of the Lumpen proletariat who are parasites on society. And he is the great parasite who is uh, exploiting France. Like it's a very simple moralistic point. Uh, and that's really the substance of what he's suggesting here. Like as as your average pickpocket preys on the average worker, so too does Louis Bonaparte uh, prey on the entire nation of France. All right, yeah. If if we're gonna charitably read Marx's rape joke from the first chapter, I think we can we can look at this and kind of crack open the rational kernel here. That makes sense. Like I, I I'm not saying that that is an adequate analysis. I'm just saying that's that's like what he's saying about about Louis Bonaparte by making so much hay out of the lumpen proletariat uh, is like he's kind of appealing to people's moralism. Uh, Tom, you still got Stank's comment up. I don't know if oh. I want to dunk Puya that part. Oh, sorry, Puya. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I can't I got, find uh, it now. I got roasted for about uh, 20 minutes or, so, or 10 minutes. Oh, baby. <laughs> Stank. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm still so good. team Puya, okay? I have it. Yeah, yeah. I sorry, got Stank Puyo. owned me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he found the uh, he found the lo like, logical mistake in my... Uh... <laughs> yeah. I, I, was just, I was just going to say, I think... Um, like, uh, we should probably tell these rape jokes to, um, what do you call them? Oh, Christ, Tom. What's that? What's that guy? On? <laughs> what's, the, what's the podcaster? The fucking biggest podcaster in the world, dude, getting a hundred million dollar contract or something. What's his name? Joe uh, Rogan. Joe, Joe, oh, Joe Rogan. Rogan. Yeah, he fucking liked him. Did you see that from during the week? Oh, Anybody God, see that yeah. clip? I did see that shit. That is yeah. not, it's nauseating, stomach flipping shit. 
Is that new? Is that like is that like a new one or is it like one of these old clips someone found or what? God, I don't I don't know. Just look, po- podcasters up against the wall. You know, if we have to go, it's <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Lazzaroni podcasters, literati, <laughs> seriously, right. scum and awful of society. <laughs> no, we, we should be called a podcasterati or something like that. That yeah, you know, that sounds like we're all castrated though. That's well, maybe we should be now. Um, it's not so bad. I, yeah, I should be castrated. Let's be honest. Uh, now, um, okay, we're going to move on and actually do some fucking new stuff this time. Uh, we'll like uh, let's see how many French words there are in here and see who we can get to read it. Right, because um, we can't give it to the two Southern Hicks. Um, right, let me see. Kyle, uh, Kyle, do you want to kick it off? You're usually good for kicking them off. M. Uh, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> uh, as a former hick myself, and 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 a, and a Calgarian, which which many Canadians would characterize as a hick, uh, I I I will uh, carry on here. Um, hey, do you want to put it into context where we are from last week as well? Um. Uh, okay, so. Uh, we have talked about uh, the way in which Bonaparte uh, used the uh, desire for order among the bourgeoisie and the party of order against them. Uh, He prevented them from uh, actually bringing anything to open conflict by using their own words by demanding tranquility and thereby uh, sidestepping his own uh, possible involvement in an assassination plot. Um, is that a, is that a fair summary of what has just happened? Yep. Okay. Uh, so here we go. At last, towards the end of December, guerrilla warfare began over a number of prerogatives of parliament. The movement got bogged down in petty squabbles about the prerogatives of the two powers since the bourgeoisie had done away with the class struggle for the moment by abolishing universal suffrage. A judgment for... Sorry for jumping in, but I just want to highlight that sentence. The bourgeoisie did away with the class struggle for a moment by abolishing universal, man, suffrage. That's, uh, this is where Marx is at with class struggle and, um, and democracy at this point. Anyway, moving on. Okay, uh... A judgment for debt had been obtained from the court against Mao Guin, one of the people's representatives. In answer to the inquiry of the president of the court, the minister of justice, Guel, uh, declared that a copious should be issued against the debtor without further ado. Mao Guin was thus thrown into debtor's prison. The National Assembly flared up when it learned of the assault. Not only did it order his immediate release, but it even had him fetch forcibly from Clichy the same evening by its clerk. In order, however, to confirm its faith in the sanctity of private property, and with the idea at the back of its mind of opening, in case of need, a place of safekeeping for Montagnards who had become uh, troublesome, It declared imprisonment of people's representatives for debt permissible when its consent had previously been obtained. It forgot to decree that the president might also be locked up for debt. It destroyed the last semblance of the immunity that enveloped the members of its own body. And this is why no one in Congress is ever tried for crimes. Correct. This is... This is why in, insider trading is legal now. I think it's actually technically legal at this stage in America. Uh, so f- for members of Congress, as far as I understand, insider trading was previously legal, uh, but Obama put in some rules against it, uh, which is why it became a bit of a controversy uh, when people like Pelosi uh, were, you know, Uh, Pelosi's husband were profiting off of uh, sort of insider information at the dawn of this crisis. Yeah, so one thing here to note is that uh, Clichy is the debtor's prison uh, in France. Um, 
and also a former uh, right right full back for Arsenal um, and French football international here. Uh, so, um, what do people make of this? Like we we see that they they basically just screwed themselves over by weakening. Uh, they've just weakened themselves by allowing. Like it shows that their real enemy, even though they're even though they had dismissed the power of the the revolutionary classes, the social democrats or whatever. Even though they got rid of of them, like they still see them as their main enemy. Even though they're about to like get like totally destroyed by by Bonaparte as a class, they, they're their priority, and they're they're willing even to weaken their own political power. Like the political class is willing to weaken their own political power against the executive because their real enemy is the left. Well, if I if I recall correctly, later on it, that that dynamic kind of shifts to where you got the party of order kind of warping as Republicans, um, in order to and they focus shift their focus on fighting Bonaparte more, um, so it just it, but that I think and I think you kind of see similar dynamics play throughout history, but usually that happens far too late, and so. I think we're seeing like the first kind of stage of that, perhaps. Like right now, they're focused on the wrong thing. They're focused on like, and, and this makes sense, right? They want to make sure they can continue to exploit the working class, um, but that's not real where the real threat is for them. But I don't know. I, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I'm not sure how I think of, feel about it. Like. Do is like the way to think about Bonaparte here, like as like a an autocrat who is good for the bourgeoisie. It just kind of like uh, more or less kind of lessens their political power, but they still maintain their social power. Is that kind of why in like Germany, and obviously Bonapartism isn't the same as fascism, but to kind of see something that rhymes with that in Germany, you had some of the bourgeoisie. Um, trying to stop Hitler. Uh, I mean, far too late, obviously, but they had, they, they were a part of some plots at certain points. Um, maybe it's just because they simply wanted to have say in government and they didn't anymore. You know, I don't know. I'm just kind of spitballing. I, I think, I think you're right. Um, I missed the last section. Sorry. I was trying to do something here, but um, Lex or Esri uh, talking about this point here, um, Esri's uh, oh, away. Sorry. Okay, sorry. So just getting to Esri's point here, uh, I'll bring it up again then. But um, since the bourgeoisie had done away with the class struggle for the moment by abolishing universal suffrage, I think the point that Marx is making here is that like they got beat on the street, and then their the struggle went in went into the parliament for a while, and then they basically defeated them on the parliament too. Yeah. He's not making and, the case that it's gone. That's oh, it's only in voting where the class struggle is from now on, or anything. No, I don't think that's what she was saying either. Because we talked about this last night. She's just the point she was making to me last night, and I'll let her speak on it when she's back. But the point that she was making to me last night was more along the lines of like we were talking about like ultra leftism and all that, and how you know you you could try as you might to divorce Marx from like his focus on electoral strategy, but you see it as early as, as in this book where he is referring to political struggle as a central component of class struggle. You know, it's not the only thing in, in Marx, but it's like a it's like a key thing. It's a key part of it. And he could be wrong, honestly. And I, I, I'm kind of inclined I don't think of myself as an ultra leftist, but I think like we were really like going back and forth on this. And I think, you know, finding some kind of center left strategy for me is kind of what I want to do. Like, I don't think in using center left as like a, in the McNair sense, um, I don't think focusing a lot of effort on elections, even in, in countries that don't have first past the post is like a really viable method in my opinion. But I think, using elections strategically as a way to like boost your party's presence is okay. Anyway, that's also uh, the thing. Yeah, I, I definitely think that um, 
uh, I don't think electoralism is going to work in the U.S. especially. Oh, agreed. Um, and people, yeah, yeah, and the, it seems to be very unpopular with the people that you'd probably be uh, pulling off of as your base of support. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the situation at this point in France is that, like, when the Montaigne was interacting with the rest of Parliament, like, it was a very acrimonious relationship, right? And, like, oftentimes you saw the fight in Parliament being related to a fight in the street. Um the parliamentary struggle was kind of obviously related to what was happening in society in general. Uh, and so I don't think it's, it's that surprising that Marx sees that, uh, you know, the Montaigne being defeated in parliament was representative of like a crushing of the proletarian side uh, in, in the class struggle in general. You know, whereas now it's kind of like the political sphere in America is just way out of touch. Um, in, in a similar way to what the uh, party of order established once they did crush the Montaigne, right? That the, the struggle between Bonaparte and the party of order was uh, a political struggle that was largely uh, divorced from the social. Yeah, totally. It's literally. It became a a battle of who will represent the bourgeoisie. Yeah, I think um, Sophia basically like fairly represented my point. There is a slight turn around the Paris Commune towards like alternative forms or whatever, but in terms of Marxist theory of how dictatorship of the proletariat is established and what the class struggle ultimately entails, like. You know, Marx is, of course, interested in economic activity and strikes and that sort of thing. And I'm sure if he could see our, our situation, he would appreciate the role of riots and the class struggle and that sort of thing. But ultimately, for Marx, what makes a transition to communism plausible is the proletariat, like wresting the state from the bourgeoisie in some way to destroy it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read the next bit then. Okay. Let let let's jump into it. Today is going to be one of the slowest days ever. After an hour oh, yeah. talking about <laughs> three sentences from last week's fucking part. Right. Okay. Um. Uh. Okay. It will be remembered that acting on the information given by a certain LA police commissioner, Jan, had denounced a section of the Decemberists for planning the murders of Dupin, Dupin and Changarnier. In reference to this, at the very first session, the Quaestors made the proposal that Parliament should form a police force of its own, paid out of the private budget of the National Assembly and absolutely independent of the police prefect. The Minister of Interior of the Interior, Baroche, protested against this invasion on his domain. A miserable compromise in this matter was concluded, according to which, true, the police commissioner of the assembly was to be paid out of its private budget and to be appointed and dismissed by its quaestors, but only after previous agreement with the minister of the interior. Meanwhile, the government had started criminal proceedings against Alé, and here it was easy to represent his information as a hoax, and through the mouth of the public prosecutor to cast ridicule upon Dupin. Changarnier, Yon, and the whole National Assembly. Thereupon, on December 29th, Minister Baroche writes a letter to Dupin in which he dismisses, in which he demands Yon's dismissal. The Bureau of the Assembly, alarmed by its violence in the uh, Maguin affair, and accustomed when it has when it has ventured a blow to the executive to receive two blows from it in return, does not sanction this decision. It dismisses Jan as a reward for his official zeal and robs itself 
of a parliamentary prerogative indispensable against a man who does not decide by night in order to execute by day, but decides by day and executes by night. Okay. Um, so we're going to get into a lot of this in shenanigans today with all the ins and outs of what's going on. So essentially what's happened here is that there was a plot by the Decembrists to kill, uh, you know, Dupin and Jean Garnier. Uh, and Jan was the police commissioner who was actually looking into it. But um, they, the, the parliament didn't back up Jan. They never interrogated it. Uh, as they were supposed to do it in um, in Parliament, they never set up the uh, the commission in Parliament that was going to uh, look at all of this stuff. And when they backed down on that, it it allowed Napoleon and his like uh, ministers to make it out as all being a crazy plot and and to basically get rid of who are who were actually their enemies in the National Assembly. So like. The party of order just seems to be stripping away every goddamn piece of actual machinery they could use to defend themselves bit by bit. It, it's kind of insane. Tranquility. France demands tranquility. That is true. That, that's a very good point. That, that is it. I, I really like this last line. Um, it dismisses Jan as a reward for his official zeal and robs itself of a parliamentary prerogative indispensable against a man who does not decide by night in order to execute by day, but decides by day and executes by night. <laughs> Very he, ominous. Seriously, he, he's always doing these little one-liner switches where he just reverses the causality. It's a very good kind of a, of a writing style, a theatrical kind of motif or something. It reminds yeah. me of... There was a British um, Tory uh, leader, is it Michael Howard, and one of his fellow Tories um, uh, ministers described him as saying something like there was something of the night about him, and he kind of did look slightly vampirish. It, it really stuck. It, this line just really reminds me of it. Nobody here remembers Michael Howard, do they? He only lasted about two years. <laughs> Michael Howard, he was the <laughs> one like before, it. he was the leader before David Cameron of the Tories. Holy oh, shit. No, I don't. Wow. I, I, I actually forgot he existed. That's amazing. Wow. Actually, yeah. This guy here. He, he was in Walla. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, that guy. Right? He uh, kind of looks like a thumb. When was this? <laughs> When he was younger and he had dark hair, he did kind of look like he was like a kind of like he was like a vampire or something. <laughs> like a, like an Anne Rice vampire, like Count Chocula. Yeah, Count, yes, Count Choc Chocula. Okay. There is a um, bit of the Chocula about him. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Right. I don't know who who is Anne Rice and who is the Chocula. We'll tell you when you're older, Tom. <laughs> Seriously, it's one of those. God damn it. Right. Let's keep going here. Uh, um, I'll fire into this next paragraph. These are, um, um, we'll see how we get on. All right. Uh, anybody else? Um, Sophie, do you want to read one? Sure. I'll probably butcher the French, but that's fine. Uh, let's see if there's any fa hard French words here before we start. Um, Looks pretty good. There's, I don't yeah, think there's actually, there's not even one fucking word in here, so you can't be Bonaparte. Do you know how to say Bonaparte? Zero words. There's no words that are descended from French here. I'm kidding. I don't know. Probably not. Anyway. Probably about probably about fucking forty percent. Forty percent of English is French anyway. Okay, fire ahead. We have seen how, on great and striking occasions during the months of November and December, the National Assembly avoided or quashed the struggle with the executive power. Now we see it compelled to take up the struggle on the pettiest occasions. In Monnier. In the Manian affair, it confirms the principle of imprisoning people's representatives for debt, but reserves the right to have it appealed only by representatives obnoxious to itself and wrangles over this infamous privilege. It's um, a sorry, of just, uh, sorry. You, said, uh, you said appealed instead of applied. Um, applied uh, to. Sorry, ADHD brain. Um, 
the, 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 the. Swiss family. Yeah. In the Monnier affair, it confirms the principle of imprisoning people's representatives for debt, but reserves the right to have it applied only to representatives obnoxious to itself and wrangles over this infamous privilege with the Minister of Justice. Instead of availing itself of the alleged murder plot to decree an inquiry into the society of December 10 and irredeemably unmasking Bonaparte before France and Europe in his true character of chief of the Paris lumpen proletariat, it lets the conflict be degraded to a point where only the issue between it and the Minister of the Interior is which of between it and the Minister of the Interior is which of them... Sorry, um, you said where uh, only the issue, where it's where the only issue, um, just from it lets the conflict... It lets the conflict be degraded to a point where the only issue between it and the Minister of the Interior is which of them has the authority to appoint and dismiss a police commissioner. Thus, during the whole... Thus, during the whole of this period, we see the party of order compelled by its equivocal, bull, ugh, equivocal position to dissipate and disintegrate its struggle with the executive power in petty jurisdictional squabbles, petty foggery, legalistic hair splitting, and de delimitational disputes, and to make the most ridiculous matter of form the substance of its activity. It does not dare take up the conflict at the moment when this has significance from the standpoint of, from the standpoint of principle. When the executive power, ha when the, ex uh, when the executive power has really exposed itself and the cause of the national assembly would be the cause of the nation. By so doing, it would give the nation its marching orders, it, and it fears nothing more than the nation should move. On such occasions, it accordingly rejects the notions of the Montagne and proceeds to the order of the day. The question at issue, in its large aspects having thus been dropped, the executive power calmly waits for the time when it can again take up the same question on petty in insignificant occasions, when this is, when this is, so to speak, of only local parliamentary interests, then the repressed rage of the party of order breaks out. Then it tears the current away from the colossies. Then it denounces the president. Then it declares the republic in danger. But then also, it's fervor appears absurd and the occasion for the struggle become and the occasion for the struggle seems a hypocritical hypocritical pretext or altogether not worth fighting about Hip hypocritical i don't know why i swear that it's hypocritical uh and the occasion for struggle seems a hypocritical pretext or altogether not worth fighting about the parliamentary storm becomes a storm in a teacup the fight becomes an intrigue, the conflict a, a scandal. While the revolutionary class, while the revolutionary classes gloat with malicious joy over the humiliation of the National Assembly, for they are just as enthusiastic about the parliamentary prerogatives of this assembly as the latter is about the public liberties, the bourgeoisie outside the parliament does not understand how the bourgeoisie inside the parliament can waste time over such petty squabbles and imperial tranquility by such pitiful rivalries with the president. It becomes confused by a strategy that makes peace at the moment when all the world is expecting battles and attacks at the moment when all the world believes peace has been made. Okay. Like, there's like two, two things I'd like to say here. Fucking Russia Gate, number one. And number Russia, two, Russia, Russia. And number two is Nancy Pelosi ripping up Trump's speech after giving him like oh. an increased military budget and spying budget, domestic spying yeah. budget. But I feel like people fall for that shit. Well, I, I, people or like politically engaged, like you know, 
I don't want to say they're not people. I'm just saying they're they're not, not people. They're not people. <laughs> I'll let Tom say it. But all I was saying is that that's the general population sees it. You're no, right. They like they know what they're saying. They're they're more credulous towards reality TV than to that shit. Right. Like they know that that's bullshit, and then they might think that professional wrestling's you know might be legit at the same time. And you know what? <laughs> like, they're like that's that's legitimate. Like professional wrestling actually has more nicks and cuts and bruises than politics. Agreed. I just found this paragraph uh, like totally descriptive of current American politics to an amazing extent. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's fucking pathetic. It, uh, ever... Pelosi is a petty fogger if I've ever seen one. <laughs> If I had ever written anything like this for, uh, like, school, they would fail me. (laughs) 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 That would get a failing grade. Science program. Yeah, they would fail me. I would get a failing grade if I ever wrote something like this. (laughs) They would. They would just go F. Like they would see. They would read the first paragraph and give me an F. Like, what branch of biology do you study? Me? Am I wrong? Chemistry. It's chemistry. Physical chemistry. Yeah. Damn it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, if if you have this much rage about like something in chemistry, I I would wonder. No, but it's like I can't even like. I don't know. <laughs> say it. Say it. It's not just like. Um, Uh, this is, it's so, like, has so many adjectives and, like, so many, uh, um, what are they called? Uh, God, I'm not a writer. Like, um, when you do comparisons, oh, the parliamentary swell becomes a storm in a teacup. Similes, similes and shit like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 like, all this, like. Do you not like that? You just like reading fucking binary codes. You're not allowed to speak anymore. Let's fucking (laughs) you. (laughs) <laughs> this is really they're fucking sick birds. Shit. They're sick birds. <laughs> yeah, no, th- this is what's known as dunking. Um, it, now, you, might, you, you might fail in college writing if you write like this, but on Twitter, damn, you got like six figure followers, baby. Fucking hell. You think so? It's like, seriously, this is like the Chomsky school of fucking political discussion, Puya is from. You know, you have to you have to basically say all your fucking political points in like uh, analytic philosophy style. Jesus Christ! Oh, who yeah, you're well, you're banned can, from now on. You're on purpose, <laughs> right? I, have you but like, who can the, who can notes? even understand this? I can. Jesus, yeah, I know, hard. I know. But like, you have to like sit down and like and like <laughs> and read it. Puya, and, Puya, yeah. this, Puya, you have to remember. <laughs> Oh my god. This is this is the era where people like Dickens are writing novels, you know? Like this is, well, this is pre-Dickens, I guess, but it's it's this like is better you know, than people people had people had an appetite for lots of text at this point in time. There was is all I'm saying. That's why. Yeah, yeah Seriously, they, they like the they like, like the um, what is what is the he used some ridiculous word, petty frogger, foggery. That's just an old fashioned word, like fucking yeah, yeah. hell. Like, seriously, I'm bringing like, it back. This is brilliant writing. I don't give a shit what anybody says. That's just like you've been reading fucking chemistry papers, and now you come here <laughs> giving out about this fucking like masterpiece of historical writing. My god, <laughs> kill all the fucking engineers, kill all the engineers. No, no, no. Derek was here. Uh, he uh... child in bed, soldier. You know, I'm the soldier defending Puya here. I can't believe this is happening. And Derek isn't even here. Jesus Christ, yeah, 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 yeah. You know that Puya Defender has logged on. Yeah, Puya Defender has logged on. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> I've got I've got I've got my backup. <laughs> got the gang. Yeah. Oh, I guess okay. I have to check everyone's hands and see if they're smooth enough to die. Yeah, okay. So if, if this was if this was written in modern writing, it would be broken up into like six paragraphs. <laughs> but it's still damn good writing, is all I'm gonna yeah, say about it. Writing, I yeah. agree. And and, 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 and 
Not only that, but he is able to do it all in one sentence. <laughs> well, to no, kind of like defend Kui a little bit here, though, I think this is a good this is good writing. It's a good middle ground between like my APA style or reading like bio textbooks versus um, something like EndNotes, which I brought up earlier as like a joke. But really, like I realize I don't hate communization that much. I hate their writing style. It makes me want to pull my fucking hair out. Because I learned to write in APA and I wrote like honors papers and shit like that for them. And it's too, you get to the fucking point with that. Whereas yeah, right? Like, with, with end notes and that kind of style of writing, like it's very flowery and poetic and kind of influenced by Althusser. And I just want to like take it out back and shoot it with my gun. <laughs> okay, but we're, we're not doing any more. I'm moving this on. We're not doing any more talking on writing style. This is, I'd fucking yeah. edit all this shit out. Right now. Let, let, okay, let's okay. go. Let's go on to the next bit here. Um, Tom, you might you might want to take your uh, your Stalinist uh, purge message. I, do, I don't know. I'm I, I'm I'm very annoyed now. I, it's going to take me a while <laughs> to take it down. Right. Uh, I leave it another until I talk this little bit. Um, so we're going to go on to the next part. We're going to skip a little bit here, where he talks about um, uh, how he set up uh, a really uh, dodgy lottery where he printed like 20 times the number of winning tickets. Um, this was what um, Bonaparte did to get some more cash and how he promised to set up some workhouses and, uh, you know, did that trick that all rich uh, Western countries do where they pledge a certain amount of charity money to a disaster case and then give like a tenth of what they actually pledged. So at, at this point here, then um, we're going to get to what's what happens in the National Assembly about all of this. Lex or Esri, how how do you feel about writing? How re, writing? <laughs> how do you feel I about reading writing. this bit? Love it. Yeah, great at it. What? Do you want to read this bit? From Let's do it. I'm ready to flex see? my audiobook voice. Here, the National Assembly was confronted not with the fictitious president of the Republic, but with Bonaparte in the flesh. Here, it could catch him in the act, in conflict not with the Constitution, but with the code penal, with the penal code. If after Dupras' interpolation, it proceeded to the order of the day, this had not happened merely because Girardin's motion that it should declare itself satisfied reminded the party of order of its own systematic corruption. The bourgeois and overall, excuse me, and above all, the bourgeoisie, oh wow, the bourgeois and above all the bourgeois inflated into a statesman supplements his practical meanness by theoretical extravagance. As a statesman, he becomes like the state power that confronts him, a higher being that can be fought only in a higher consecrated fashion. Bonaparte, who, Bonaparte, who precisely because he was a bohemian, a princely lumpen proletarian, had the advantage over a rascally bourgeois and that he could conduct the struggle meanly, now saw after the assembly guided him with its own hand across the slippery ground of the military banquets, the reviews, the society of December 10th, and finally the code penal, that the moment had come when he could pass from an apparent defensive to the offensive. The minor defeats, meanwhile, sustained by the minister of justice the Minister of War, the Minister of the Navy, and, and the Minister of Finance, through which the National Assembly signified its snarling displeasure, troubled him little. He not only prevented the ministers from resigning and thus recognizing the sovereignty of Parliament over the executive power, but could now consummate what he had begun during the recess of the National Assembly, the severance of the military power from Parliament, the removal of Jean Garnier. And if you want me to read that, you gotta scroll down. Great, great, great. Um, sorry. An Elysee paper. Did I say that right, Kyle? It... No, Kyle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Elysee. Elysee, yeah. Thank you. An Elysee paper. If you just think, order... that's from, if you think about the Champs Elysee, that's what it's from. Yeah, that's why I know how to pronounce it. Cool. All right. An Elysee paper published an order of the day alleged to have been addressed during the month of May to the first army division and therefore proceeding from Jean Garnier in which the officers were urged, excuse me, 
in the event of an insurrection, to give no quarter to the traitors in their ranks, but to shoot them immediately, and to refuse troops to the National Assembly if it should requisition them. On January 3rd, 1851, the cabinet was interpolated concerning this order of the day. For the investigation of this matter, it requests a breathing space, first of three months, then of a week, finally of only 24 hours. The assembly insists on an immediate explanation. Changarnier rises and declares that there was never such an order of the day. He adds that he will always hasten to comply with the demands of the National Assembly and that in case of a clash, it can count on him. It receives his declaration with indescribable applause and passes a vote of confidence in him. It abdicates, it decrees its own impotence and the omnipotence of the army by placing itself under the private protection of a general. But the general deceives himself when he puts at his command against Bonaparte a power that he holds only as a fief from the same Bonaparte. And when in his turn, he expects to be protected by this parliament, his own protege in need of protection. Sean Garnier, however, believes in the mysterious power with which the bourgeoisie has endowed him since January 29th, 1849. He considers himself the third power existing side by side with both, the, with both the other state powers. He shares the fate of the rest of this epoch's heroes, or rather saints, whose greatness consists precisely in the biased great opinion of them that their party creates in its own interests and who shrink to everyday figures as soon as circumstances call upon them to perform miracles. Unbelief is, in general, the mortal enemy of these reputed heroes who are really saints. Hence, their majestically moral indignation at the dearth of enthusiasm displayed by wits and scoffers. Well, there's a lot of goddamn <laughs> uh, shade being thrown in these two paragraphs. <laughs> Kyle, you normally like to talk about the snarky McCollins. <laughs> What do you got to say oh, about this? It's wonderful. It's so good. Uh, like, I think I think maybe the the sort of connotations of saints comes out differently in a in a different uh, language or culture. Uh, it it maybe doesn't hit quite as hard, but you can kind of imagine, you know, that opposition between heroes who can actually get shit done. And saints who are just there as like you know kind of like moral figures uh, who are martyred or or call upon miracles, um, yeah. So it, it, it's really good, uh, and mm. just you know, I love this idea of this sort of heightened opinion that the bourgeois has of themselves when they enter into government and become states uh, states people right so like it's it's i feel like this idea of the bourgeois states person as being an intellectual is somewhat dated but that kind of aura of office that he uh, that marx is pointing at is nevertheless still very much there it's like um, you know, you've got Thatcherism, you've got Reaganism, you've got Trumpism, you've got you know, they put an ism on someone's name when they've got no no thought that that a new thought that ever entered any of their heads. But I, I would say yeah, that I well, but I, I will I will just like clarify what I meant there is that you have people in the party of order who are like legitimate intellectuals and are writing like groundbreaking treaties like they're they're not simply uh political hacks uh but that that's what i mean when they when i'm talking about the theoretical extravagance being somewhat a dated concept like you just don't have that anymore yeah definitely and i think that's a function of like this was like the we're in the times here of the bourgeois revolutions where they, the, the revolutions and the political uh, forces at work, they need their higher philosophical treaties to give them power, to give them strength and support. You know, what we have now is like this, like, you know, 
we we talked about decadent theory i think uh, last last week but like you have these like you know fat uh you i don't know what i was going to say not fat um that's a bad word uh i was going to say like you have these like you know it's like a lot of roman senators sitting around a vomitorium that, that that's what our parliaments are like that's what the right wing parliament the, the right wing parties in like the modern democratic countries are like they if anything it's nearly the far right have more uh actual theoretical work at this stage yeah, like the the closest thing we had in Canada was like in recent history was Michael Ignatieff, who was kind of like a, a sort of popular intellectual, like a, a neoliberal hawkish hack, um, who really played up his aristocratic background uh, in in the the Russian aristocracy and became the leader of the Liberal Party and was just like a catastrophically bad politician um, and quickly was given the boot uh, for the politicos to take uh, power once again. Um, Puya or, or Esri or Sophia, do you want to talk anything about this 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 lump here? Um, no, not really. Um, yeah, it's just, you know, basically self-congratulation and, oh, my God, you know. On, honestly, the thing it, it really reminds me of is um, Obama. You know, like, Obama's, like, going to be this great figure. He's going to do all this stuff. And then when he finally gets into office, even with a supermajority, he can't get through his major campaign promise. Like, period. Or doesn't want to. No, he just, I think it was just for the campaigning. I don't think he was... He wasn't going to do that stuff, I don't think. I mean, you know, he could have. He he could have just simple game theory says he could have pushed it through, could have used the bully pulpit of the presidency. And so, yeah, I guess that's a credit to your point. It's not because it wasn't a consensus idea, you know, like, that's not why. Anyway, axe grinding, millennial axe grinding. Would really like some health care. <laughs> yeah, right, same. I really need it. But uh, um, should uh, should I read? Um, okay, I'm just trying to see. Sorry, sorry, Puya, one second here. Um, between all these fucking messes and getting left, right, and center. Um, let's have a look. Uh, how much have we got left? Oh, for fuck's sake, look at all. Oh my god, I've underlined everything. Fucking hell. Okay. Um. Okay. Uh, so let's let's just do a little roundup. Sorry, this is going to be a hard edit, but um, so. Um, we haven't really talked too much about what this meant for Shane Garnier. Um, Kyle, what what is what does all this mean for Shane Garnier? Oh well, he he's sided with a spineless parliament and assumed that he has a kind of charismatic power over the army, but on in terms of the. Uh, both the, the law and the actual state of play, thanks to Napoleon's uh, sausages. Um, that's he a, that's really a dodgy. <laughs> yeah, remember the picnics and the sausages where Napoleon was buying off the soldiers? I know, but it sounds uh, like he was, he was boning to them Napoleon. all. In the, he, he, to was the boning them, yeah, he was boning them all in the barracks. Well, you know, like... Uh, I, I got no problem with that. Um, if if that swayed the troops, then all power to him. Fair enough. Uh, oh, fair fair play. <laughs> uh, must, uh, must be some bone. Yeah. Uh, so um, essentially, Sean Garnier neither has like power on paper nor actual power over the military, which he assumes he has. Um, and for some reason has deluded himself into thinking having the support of parliament means anything when they are spineless and largely uh, discredited. Okay. Um, Puya, let's have a go at the next little bit. Are you ready? 
Booyah. Booyah live. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, okay. What does the paragraph start with? The That same evening. Okay. Same. Okay, that same evening, the ministers were summoned to the Ilise. Uh Bonaparte insisted on the dismissal of a Shang Garnier. Five mem- ministers refused to sign. The Montagneau um, announces... Monitor. Uh, the, mo- the Monitor. Monitor. Announces... Yeah, uh, never know, right? <laughs> announces a ministerial crisis. And the... Um, press of the party of order threatens to form a parliamentary army under the Shen Garnier's command. The party of order had a constitutional authority to take this step. <clears throat> it merely had to appoint Shen Garnier president of a national assembly and requisition any number of troops it pleased for its protection. It could, to, <clears throat> could do so all the more safely as uh, Shen Garnier still actually stood at the head of the army of Paris National Guard and was only waiting to be requisitioned together with the army. The Bonapartist press... Sorry, sorry, not... uh, sorry, Booyah. Um, he stood at the head of the army and the Paris National Guard. Can you just re-read that sentence? Oh, okay, okay. Still, uh, Shane Gurney still actually stood at the head of the army and the Paris National Guard, and was only waiting to be requisitioned together with the army. The Bonapartist press did not yet even dare the question the right of the National Assembly to requisition troops directly. A legal scruple that had that in the given circumstances uh, did not look promising. The army would have obeyed the order of a national assembly it is probable when one bears in mind that the Bonaparte had to search all of Paris for eight days in order finally to find two generals, uh, Bergouille de Hillers and Saint Jean de Angli, who declared themselves ready to co sign. Uh, Shane Garnier's dismissal. But the party of order, however, would have found its own ranks and in the parliament the necessary number of votes for such resolution is more than doubtful. When one considers that eight days later, 286 votes detached themselves from the party and in December 1851, <clears throat> at the last hour of decision, the uh, Montague still rejected um, Not the so Montague, like, sorry, the Montagne. Montagne, okay, okay. Uh, the Montagne still rejected a similar proposal. Nevertheless, the Berg, Berggraves might still, ah, might perhaps still, uh, where am I? Have succeeded in spurring masses of their party to a heroism that consists consisted in feeling themselves secure behind a forest of bayonets and accepting the services of an army that had deserted their camp. Instead of this, on the evening of January 6th... Sorry, uh, I, sorry, Puya. It says deserted to their camp, not deserted oh, okay. their camp. Yeah, can you say that bit again? I deserted to their camp. Instead of this, uh, on the evening of January 6th, uh, Missers, the Burgraves, uh, betook themselves to the Elysee to make uh, Bonaparte desist from uh, dismissing Chen Garnier by using statesmanlike phrases and urging considerations of the state. Whomever one would seek to persuade, on acknowledgement, on a, one acknowledges as master of the situation. On January 12th, Bonaparte, um, assured by the step, appoints a new ministry in which the leaders of the old ministry, Food and Baro, remain. Uh, Saint Jean d'Angli would become minister of uh, would become war minister. The Montagneau publishes the decree dismissing Shane Garnier. The Monitor, the Monitor. Oh gosh, I can never. It's so difficult. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> yeah, yeah. fucking French. Jeez. Monitor, yeah, right. The Monitor publishes the decree dismissing Shane Garnier and his command between. Baraguay de Hillers, who receives First Army Division, and you skip. Perel. You're skipping words all over the place here. Uh, yeah. You I? said okay. he, you said his com- the command is divided between yeah and his command. Oh, and his command is divided between Baraguay de Hillers, who receives the First Army Division, and Perot, who receives the National Guard. The bulwark of society has been discharged, and while this did not cause any tiles to fall from the roofs 
uh, quotations on the Buros are, on the other hand, going up. That's the Buros. Can you Bruce. say the Bur Buros? Okay. So Shangarni is is, is dead. <laughs> well, he's not dead, but like his power is gone, Oops. and Oops. and like what what's very interesting here is that while the Party of Order could have actually, you know, technically, legally, and probably, poli probably politically, if they had if they had been able to get the vote vote through to do this, uh, to to make Jean Garnier the president of the National Assembly and let him raise his own army, uh, it would have succeeded. But the thing is, at this stage, the party of order had so weakened their own party by their shenanigans and their inability to, to be decisive at the right times and their ability to be decisive at the wrong times. Uh, it, their party order was starting to fall apart and they were leeching people from the party of order into the, into the Bonapartist camp. And so they would probably would have found it difficult to even get that vote through, which it shows you all the shenanigans that they've done, all their base, essentially, the bourgeoisie base are actually, at this moment, they're starting to slowly disintegrate and go towards Napoleon. So, like... Well, and, and finance capital has been supportive of Bonaparte uh, up until this point, and they're thrilled that Sean Garnier is out and Bonaparte's on the up. Okay, um, Esri, I, I know you're... Yes? <laughs> you're busy uh, on Facebook. Um, Am I? Are yes. you? I'm not, I'm not as busy as you. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm just sitting here staring at the screen. Okay. Right? Uh, right. No, I was going to get you in to talk about this. That's what I was going to say, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I don't have that much to say about this. I have more to say about the coming paragraphs. Okay. Um, is there anything we haven't uh, hit on here? I suppose, you know, this is just kind of like, for me, this, this like, it's it shows the dynamics in kind of political disintegration, you know, that uh that that people think that they have all the power but really underneath that there is lots of things shifting and when the push comes to the shove uh when real things need to be done we see where the the political power is like like when trump ordered the the troops onto the streets and the army kind of went and uh, uh, no lads no we're not going to do that like it seems to have taken a no i, I don't know from what it's like over there but from from over here, like that decision seems to have really kind of like, you know, uh, cut the, I don't know that expression, not to cut the legs from underneath him, but like. Um, Pulled the really, rug out from under him. It has a bit, like, what does it feel like over there? Like, has, yeah. that, has that pulled the rug out of the idea as the president being the primary political function in America to some extent from like a, a real unitary power? I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's, done that damage to the institution but it certainly makes trump seem like the paper tiger that he's he's he is what it makes me think in particular is that um all the kind of uh people freaking out and thinking that trump's gonna try to like do a coup he clearly just can't even if he wanted to and i don't think that was ever really in the cards but people talk that way he doesn't have the legitimacy to pull that off even within like the top brass. And honestly, that was part of his appeal is that he didn't have the legitimacy of the of the state. <laughs> Rip. But I, in this situation, like the loyalty of the state is more bifurcated because you know sausages. <laughs> sausage metaphysics are moving the world. Um, Girl, let me get that sausage metaphysics. <laughs> coming right up. <laughs> nice. it's, the, like, uh, it's like the, the physicists thought the universe was a was a torus shaped like for, like a donut for the cops but actually it's like a sausage for bonaparte oh there saying. we go there we go that's that's some marxism right there Freud is, it actually, day. is it actually donut shaped <laughs> i don't think don't start Pooh, you don't fucking start we're not going to start <laughs> talking about thermodynamics god damn it uh, 
I think it started for. I think it's going out. It's the sauce that's going through it down. (laughs) That's what I heard. I mean, I don't know about space or anything, but I heard that it's going out. No. Okay. Yeah. Like a like a like a sphere. No, I think it's supposed to be a. It's supposed to be a torus. I think it was the late. Was one of the. What was one of the. On the ones I think that well, explains think... why it was inf- infinite because it seems infinite, but it actually is not wrapped around uh, uh, itself or something. No, let's not go there. Let's not go. Okay, no. okay, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, I, do, I do just want to note the line whomever one seeks to persuade, one acknowledges as master of the situation. That's that's a, that's some good stuff there. That's a brilliant point. That, that, that is like a dictum that you should bear in mind in life and in politics. Absolutely. I meant to I meant to I meant to point that out when I was reading it. That was like that really stood out to me. Like, you know, it's like look at look at the what what also strikes me about the current movement going on in America is that they're not going to the politicians looking for stuff. Because it seems some I don't know, maybe it's like that people have copped on to some extent that 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 that's not an effective I don't know. Maybe that maybe that because the politicians are losing legitimacy, your people are going fuck the politicians. The political system is all a load of rubbish. We're going out in the streets and we're going to do it for ourselves. Like I think there's an element of that. Do you think anybody think I'm going over the top of that? No, no, that's definitely true. I think there's like regular people being like, I got my mouth book in the mail. Like we're going to be fighting in the streets. Let's join the SRA. <laughs> At least, Beautiful. like, <laughs> I mean, what well, have you been going to the uh, things, um, Ezri, like the protests and whatnot? Uh, I've just, I've just been moving. I, I have, uh, I definitely have uh, communization FOMO. I'll put it that way. I've, but even I've been to one of them, and yeah, it's it's pretty inspiring. I would say. Um, I yeah, it's... Been, I haven't been seeing like regular people ro- ro- rolling around with their uh, SRA card member call. Uh, club member card in their mouth book red little red book but people are really fucking like fed up and you know i was saying with with tom like i went to like i think somebody mentioned that some of these are um kind of like festivals right and i actually like went to one of those and uh like they're organizing there (laughs) And like, uh, what do they do? They just play like music, and have uh, kind of people. I mean, if you're not like theory ahead, then and you don't, uh, you know, you just want to be able to go somewhere where you can, you know, just listen to music and hang out and talk to people that you agree with politically. And like, they're kind of drawing on these people. Are you referring to what? What are you referring to specifically? Was, are you referring to Chaz? Sounds sounds like Chaz. No, no, no. Just in my area. SRA. SRA. No, just in my area. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, like well, they're, they're just nothing wrong with like doing like a hangout kind of like. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like super rad protest, yeah. march, looting, rioting all the time. It's, it's good yeah, to, like, and like the people and, and like the, stuff. Uh, lefty block like, party. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're having, and they have like. That's pretty cool. Uh, actually. And then it's like the SRA is there and like the IWW is there and and they and like there's regular people being like uh yeah I'm try- I want I want to join the SRA and like I just ordered my first Mao book in the mail. <laughs> well, they're well on the path to not being regular people then, I guess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're on their path to being disillusioned within fucking 4 months. Or or they're like uh, I want to join a militia. They don't say I want to join the SRA, but they say like I want. I want we need to get, we need to get organized and like we need to get. I got my first book. <laughs> like, oh, there's there was, there was somebody saying that yesterday. It was like so funny. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well all right. we we first do back militias. Kids. We, first thing we communist kids being born. Yeah, yeah that's, we... that's something I, I guess. <laughs> no, it was really nice. I don't. I, I mean, okay. maybe the mouth, maybe the mouth thing was like okay, that's not TC. Like was that theoretically correct? But like. <laughs> TC, you know, folks. That's yeah. a high, highly ironic usage of politically correct, but continue like it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not exactly TC, but uh, you know, I was like, uh, you know, it's not theoretically correct, but it's 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 fine. 
<laughs> it's yeah, really nice. No, I hear you. Uh, Kyle, yeah. I, I want to just echo that um, usage of the dictum, you know, who you seek to persuade, you acknowledge as master. It does make me, you know, reconsider orienting towards the different nerds, you know, towards the, the STEM kind of like STEM Marxists and stuff. But then again, maybe... what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that, Ezri? Oh, because, you know, broadly speaking, like, I think Marxism, look, like people don't need Marxism to do proletarian self-activity. You know, you formulate Marxist theory for the most part for other Marxists. And like, I don't really think Marxists are generally the, like the sort of organic Marxists that tend to pop up. They tend not to be, sorry, the highest quality thinkers. And I would like to see better Marxists out there. So my persuasion access is more towards persuading like uh, STEM types towards Marxism and, and talking to them. I think that has more to do with what I think I'm equipped for than who I acknowledge as master uh, of the situation. But all the same, I mean, Daddy Marx said something, so I have to chew on it. Wow. <laughs> all right, Jake P says, just sat down to watch this. And some random guy appears and seems to start unzipping his trousers in my garden, but moves to make an escape after seeing me. Ha ha. That's the best. That, that is the best uh, comment we've had in the chat in quite some time, I must say. <laughs> the damn lumpy proletariat putting a Bonapartist agent at your door. Bonaparte. <laughs> Bonaparte. Um, yeah, it, like I'm going to have to put up a few more uh, kill all the engineers to get back to get back on top, Jake. Um, oh my god! Oh, okay. He, <laughs> Sophie, like Sophie's trying to pretend she's got moral high ground. Now, let uh, Ezra. Do you want to take this? Yeah, right. Did this? Uh, <laughs> do you want to? Do you want to try this? Uh, this this last paragraph for tonight by repulsing. Uh, I'm sorry, me. Ezra, did I say? I said Ezra, didn't I? You did. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, I yeah. was just checking. Um. Okay. We're close to the end, aren't we? Aren't we close to the end? Uh, no, right. we're not close not to the end. Not at our pace. No, not at our pace. This is the last. Uh, we, we've got about we've got about four discussions about the nature of the universe before uh, we can make it to the end of this chapter. <laughs> oh, tits. Okay. Um. All right. So. This is, yeah, we won't do any more than this because it's beyond two hours by the time we're finished this bit, and okay. that's that's my limit. Yeah. No, that makes sense. By repulsing the army, which places itself in the person of Shangarnier at its disposal, and so surrendering the army irrevocably, irrevoc irrev irrevocably to the president, the party of order declares that the bourgeoisie has forfeited its vocation to rule. A parliamentary ministry no longer existed. Having now indeed lost its grip on the army and the National Guard, what forcible means remain to it with which simultaneously to maintain the usurped authority of parliament over the people and its constitutional authority against the president. None. Only the appeal to impotent principles remains to it now, to principles that it had itself always interpreted merely as general rules, which one prescribes for others in order to be able to move all the more freely oneself. The dismissal of Changarnier and the falling of the military power into Bonaparte's hands closes this first part of the period we're considering, the period of struggle between the party of order and the executive power. War between the two powers has now been openly declared, is openly waged, but only after the party of order has lost both arms and soldiers. Without the ministry, without the army, without the people, without public opinion, after its electoral law of May 31st, no longer the representative of the sovereign nation, sans eyes, sans ears, sans teeth, sans everything. The National Assembly had undergone a gradual transformation into an ancient French parliament that has to leave action to the government and content itself with growling remonstrances post festum, which means belatedly. Yep, so this is the way democracy dies with thunderous applause. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful so beautiful Ch 
China. Fashy mirror universe, Padme. Um, let's say. Uh, <laughs> I'm like lost in three fandoms right now. Um, okay. Um, no, I, I think this is. I think this is the sort of uh, decisive, like, breaking point. This is what Marx is saying. Um, this is what you know. One is ultimately worried about in a sort of electoral systems crisis. We we can you know forego calling it democracy because I mean it's not even really in this part. Like, it's just like bourgeois representatives, like slowly like whittling away the power of the party of order, the executive power taking over what, you know, is supposed to be bourgeois state machinery, but the bourgeoisie eventually turn on their own sort of party in a sense. And like, it's hard to just, chalk it up to the bourgeoisie i guess there are these like aristocratic like elements but a lot of those aristocratic elements you know were, were very far or you know maybe in the grand historical scheme not so far but like generationally speaking were you know we're not dealing with the ancien regime anymore we're dealing with the more bourgeoisified forms of these aristocracies and um you know the classical party of orders overcome by the executive power. Um. I think it's great because he, Marx really does like call back to what he has established at the, in the, in the early sections of this text uh, where he talks about the way in which um the laws the uh, parliament passed uh, were so equivocal and the bourgeois liberties were so equivocal. And, you know, he just keeps hammering that through the text. And then now we see, oh yeah, when you do that consistently, uh, no one's going to stand up and defend you because you, uh, you're just constantly saying, uh, do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. I mean, I'm not even sure what to say here. Cause like, I mean, we would think of this in terms of like, I don't know, bourgeoisie, like, you know, electing Hitler or something, but if this is so much further than that, because even the prospect of like elections or something or, even the, the trimmings of universal manhood suffrage, you know, which is a funny category if there ever was one, um, is, you know, that stuff has already been stripped away by now. And we're getting to the bare bones of the, of the power relations here. You know, beneath, beneath the, you know, legal superstructure, you might say. Like, this is the power relations underneath, you know, showing you what, those laws and principles that, yeah, Marx is uh, quite right in saying that, look, you you write those laws and principles or whatever to constrain other people's behavior, not yours. And if that's all you have to keep the political situation together, expect the power relations to overcome that shit. Damn straight, damn straight. Um is damn is damn straight now? Is that like a politically incorrect thing to say? I've never thought about it. Yeah, I'm canceling you as we speak. I'm on Twitter. Ah, right now. God damn it! <laughs> I can't. I, I don't know what else to say. All, all I'm saying is that, like, you know, I don't. I don't want to like uh, offend the straight community or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I'm just using it as a metaphor. For, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, th I, th I think it's like damn straight people. So, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think funny. you're in the clear. I think you're in the clear. Turned it on its head. <laughs> Jesus, that was that was good. Period. That was like the, one of those last lines he does in every paragraph where he throws the thing on his head instead of being damn straight. It was damn the straight. <laughs>
<laughs> oh god we're reading too much marks here okay uh, i think we've got enough done for today um if anybody has else anything to say about this paragraph before we rattle our something i don't know what i was gonna say sucks to suck party of order that is correct uh, i think we wait we wish mm -hmm. them farewell yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah um i don't know i don't it reminds me. I don't know why. It reminds me of a of a joke. Uh, it's it's not related at all, but I tell it because it's a funny one. What did um? Does anybody? Do people know that in Ireland there's no snakes? Does anybody yeah, know that? Yeah, of course, of course. Huh. Yeah, and the, le no, the, le the legend is that Saint Patrick, uh, he 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 got rid of them. He got he he got he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. Right. So that's that. So that's the setup for the joke. It's like what did what did Saint Patrick say when he was driving the snakes out of Ireland? What? Are you all right there in the back, lads? <laughs> oh, Tom. What? what? <laughs> what? Like in the back of the car because he was driving oh, them bitch. out of oh, Ireland. Oh, 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 oh boy. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was a bad joke, Tom. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Gone what happened? from. We've gone from the the high quality marks. We've got we've gone from the 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 low quality marks to the high quality marks to the dad joke. Uh, <laughs> that is one of my favorite jokes. Markism, dad jokeism. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. What what did the big bucket say to the little bucket? What? You're looking a little pale. <laughs> 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 oh, there, we right, go, there we go. There we go. Or, <laughs> I, I I have another one. Another one of my favorite ones is like, what did the did you hear? Did you hear the the carrot died? Oh, why is no. that? The, there was a big turn up at the funeral. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, let's go off off stream, <laughs> offline. Bye, everybody. Uh, Bye now. Take, take it easy. You remember, podcasters. Thanks, thanks for joining us. <laughs> Subscribe to our Patreon. We're bloodsuckers. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.